have some targets to do today. Do you still start on time? Yeah, they trickle in. Good morning and welcome to the Serious uh, Computer Security Seminar from Purdue University. Our speaker today is Professor David Evans from the University of Virginia. His topic is titled, Where's the Feed? The Effectiveness of Instruction Set Randomization. David? Okay, well, thank you for inviting me to come visit. Um, I will explain what a FEEB is a little later for those of you who aren't used to reading Intel x86 opcodes backwards. Um, I won't explain what the picture is. If you don't recognize the picture, talk to someone who's um, at least as old as me and American, and they can explain that part to you. So it's been observed recently that um, we're in danger of having a computing model culture. Uh, this was observed most famously by Dan Geer, um, who got fired for observing it. Um, and the problem with the computing model culture is if all the computers and all the routers are running the same software, if there's a vulnerability discovered in that software, an attacker can design an exploit that compromises millions or billions of machines at once. And the reason it's billions and not just millions is because cell phones are all running the same software too now. So biology has found a solution to this. And the solution that nature uses for this is to have diversity. Um, there's enough diversity within a species so that one parasite won't kill all members of that species. Um, and nature uses a very expensive mechanism to preserve that diversity. Um, and I don't know about Purdue students, but I know that UVA students spend a lot of effort trying to do their part to maintain diversity in the gene pool. Um, and even beyond that, even it's not just college students that do this, it applies to all organisms on Earth, basically. Because when you reproduce using this rather peculiar mechanism, half of your genes aren't even appearing in the offspring. So right away, you're doubling the cost of propagating your genes. So there must be a really good reason for this. And the only reason biologists have come up with that makes any sense is to preserve diversity. And the reason we need diversity is otherwise a species could be wiped out by a single parasite that evolves to attack that species. So people in the computer security community have noticed this. And there's been a flurry of papers over the last several years where people have proposed different techniques for obtaining diversity in computer systems. What we don't have is any theory that says how well those techniques work. Um, any way of really understanding whether or not they prevent an attack from being able to take out all systems at once. And I don't have a theory of that yet either. What I do have is some insights into how well one of these particular techniques works. And so the technique I'm going to talk about is called instruction set randomization. This was introduced simultaneously by two papers in CCS a couple years ago. And the idea is that a large class of attacks depends on an attacker injecting code that runs in a process on the victim's machine. And that injected code, in order to behave like the attacker wants, the attacker needs to know the instruction set of the machine it's attacking. So if you can change that instruction set and hide it from the attacker, then the attack won't work. Unfortunately, it's pretty difficult to design new instruction sets. This requires a lot of effort, and building a new microprocessor is very expensive. So we need some way of getting this property without needing to do that. And the way to do that is to use a randomizer. So instead of running the executable directly, we have a program that takes the executable, takes the secret key, and produces a randomized executable. And then when we execute the program, instead of executing it directly on the processor, we have some de-randomizer that surrounds the processor and will take out the randomization. So it will decrypt the randomized executable to get the original code back, and that's what runs on the processor. So for this to work, the de-randomizer needs to know the secret key as well to be able to undo the randomization that the randomizer did. And what should happen if an attacker finds a way to inject malicious code into a running process is the only way for the malicious code to get to the processor is to also go through that de-randomizer. And if the attacker doesn't know the randomization key, well, that's going to produce effectively random bits. And when you run random instructions, they're not going to do what the malicious attacker wanted. They're probably just going to crash the machine. So this is still an effective denial of service attack, but it doesn't propagate, and it doesn't do any real damage. So 
in order to actually implement this, we have some design parameters we have to decide. We have to decide what the randomizer does, when it happens, and when the de-randomizer happens. And the two proposed implementations make different decisions here. Um, the Columbia implementation uh, is focused on getting high performance. So they wanted a design that they could implement inexpensively in hardware. The RISE implementation is focused more on security uh, with the software implementation. Uh, the randomization function in both cases is just XOR. So you have some secret key, and you're XORing the bits of the instructions with that key before you execute them. Uh, the key size for the Columbia machine needed to fit in a register. So it's only 32 bits, and that same XOR key is used for all instructions. For RISE, they could afford a longer key. So it's stored in memory. The key could be as long as the program. And so each location has its own key bits. When you execute an instruction at that location, it's going to be XORed with the key at that location. So any questions on this before I go on to talk about evaluating its security? I have a question yes. on the program lens. Is it just the length of the text segment or the? Uh, it's, um, it could be the length of the text segment. So every location where there's uh, potentially code can have its own randomization key. Um, there's no randomization going on in the data. It also will try to randomize, uh, randomize the, the data segment. Or the... Um, you could randomize the data as well. Uh, the focus has been on hiding the instruction set. So at least for this particular diversity defense, um, there's no focus on the data. Yes? And so when we say randomization, do we mean the order of the statements? Do we mean add some you know, no ops? Um, so all, all these systems are doing is XORing the actual bits of the instructions. Oh, so okay. there's no reordering. There's no other changes. Um, you could certainly design systems that would do other changes. But their focus has all been on we can hide the instruction set by XORing the instructions and then XORing it out before we execute them. OK, so we want to understand how secure these are. And certainly, uh, one more question. Yeah. So I'm assuming the XOR is just used as uh, just a proof of concept and won't actually be used if you were to continue on development, such as what if the attacker were to realize that this kind of implementation were in place and they were to derive the key based off of it being ex or exclusive or So that, that's it, what I'm going to talk about how to do next, right? So, so these were certainly proposed thinking XOR provides a lot of security. And it does. right? It prevents all existing attacks that depend on executing instructions on this processor. Right? Um, and if you can protect that key, um, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to work fine. Right? Now, you're right to notice that XOR is not a very secure encryption algorithm. Right? If someone can obtain one plain text ciphertext pair, then they know what the XOR key is. So that's exactly what, what our attack attempts to do. Okay. So how secure are these systems? And our answer is, well, they're not very secure. Um, and it slows down an attack by about five minutes. Uh, and that depends on certain circumstances being true. Um, the motivation behind this work came from a paper that looked at another diversity defense, which was memory address space randomization. And they were able to attack that uh, using a brute force attack to find the key. Um, and the key space was only 24 bits. So a brute force attack works pretty well against a 24-bit key space. ISR, that's not going to work. The key space is much larger. Um, with the Columbia implementation, it's 32 bits. With the RISE implementation, it's arbitrarily long. So we can't do a brute force search on the whole key space. What we need to do is find a way to attack it in fragments. And in order to attack it in fragments, that means we need some way to tell if a partial guess is correct. So, Here's the basic idea. 